Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, so this is a report on Project uh, B12, Spatially and Temporally Informed Life Cycle Assessment of Urban Water Systems. And uh, Jen and I will share this presentation. I'm going to start the presentation and turn it over to her at about halfway, and then we'll leave uh, enough time for questions uh, at the end. Uh, we are going to talk about our project, but also the fundamental methods and tools that we're using. So this can be useful for other projects as well. At the beginning, we're going to say a few words about the project and get into the methods and tools and then come back specifically to the project that we're doing within UWIN and <clears throat> the progress uh, and the results that we have made and already have. So as Sarah mentioned, uh, this project is a collaboration. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Jen has been uh, uh, you know, bringing her tools to this project uh, that she has developed over the last 15 years or so. And then uh, we have had input from students uh, over time. Last summer, Jeff Kwan and Marcia uh, Rojas worked uh, with us. And this summer, we have Carolyn Collins um, working, uh, who just uh, started about a week ago. And she's in uh, our room as well. So any questions that we can't answer, I'm sure she will be able to. Uh, life cycle assessment is an international uh, standard uh, based method and the idea is that vector process and first uh, de uh, divided into manageable pieces that can be further studies so study so um, every product and we're going to consider the water system and the wastewater system as a product uh, starts with design there are materials that are extracted and manufactured uh, for the system. Uh, there is uh, distribution, transportation typically, uh, by pipeline or trucks or uh, other means of uh, transport involved. There's use of the product. There, is, there can be um, uh, maintenance and operation, and then there can be end of life uh, of various sorts. Uh, the inputs that we're typically interested in uh, in an environmental assessment involve various kinds of energies, energy carriers, materials, um, water, uh, or some other types of inputs. And as far as outputs go, there's, of course, the product itself. There are some co-products. Uh, and there are air emissions, water emissions, some solid waste uh, generated, and some other environmental impacts. Life cycle assessment is thought to be the method to achieve sustainable development of products, processes, and society. So this is a methodology that should be useful for uh, every project, uh, uh, not just ours. The kinds of outcomes that LCA can result in include uh, improvements, improvements in the system, improvements that society or some other stakeholders might, uh, um, uh, might set, uh, benchmarking utility performance. Uh, this is a major uh, importance uh, for us, and we're going to be talking about this a little bit later. Uh, we also want to educate the stakeholders, the consumers, or others involved with systems, uh, set some goals uh, for technology, perhaps, to achieve. Uh, of course, in terms of environmental uh, 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 metrics, but also uh, possibly in terms of cost metrics. So an integral part of what we try to do is also to keep things um, uh, affordable uh, and have uh, uh, um, the um, economic aspects of things quantified as well. Uh, we can identify some trade-offs uh, in water and wastewater systems. We're going to talk about these trade-offs a little later. Prioritize uh, some investments and decisions over others. Enable overall sustainable solutions for the future and then pass and inform uh, policies as, uh, as they are needed. So, some of the questions that one might ask in hey, the water Sam, did you want to figure out what's wrong with these speakers? And the phone on the computer? I think that we have uh, some other people in the background. It's, these are some of the uh, questions that we have been asking. We're not going to be able to answer all of them. I'm asking not just in this project, but in our work in general. But, but again, just to show you what kinds of questions life cycle assessment can inform um, is on this list. And it's very important to uh, point out that uh, 
lifestyle assessment is not a goal in and of itself. It is a means to an end. And these are the questions that we ask, and then there can be a variety of answers for them, some that are answered with LCA and some that um, may not need uh, quite an LCA process. So some of these questions involve things like components of the systems uh, and how they contribute to environmental impacts. In other words, what are the most important things we ought to be looking at? How, how do two utilities compare uh, oh, uh, through their environmental performance? Uh, or as the case may be, uh, for UN projects, not two utilities, but uh, uh, metropolitan areas, uh, multiple utilities, uh, test cities, uh, and so forth. Carbon footprinting uh, is, a, is a very popular way of uh, uh, utilization of LCA, but there's many other uh, environmental metrics that we would like to reveal and assess. Uh, the example here listed is bottled versus tap water. But no doubt a very popular and interesting question, not something that we're answering in this project in particular. Uh, energy intensity of innovative and new technologies and how does it compare to the current practice? How does integration of new technology change an existing system? For example, if we go um, uh, uh, to a more decentralized uh, wastewater treatment, how will that uh, compare to the existing conventional centralized treatment, for example? Uh, further, how do a set of potential water sources compare on the basis of a, a, holistic, a holistic set of environmental metrics? How should, where should we focus to get most bang for the buck when improving water systems? What are the trade-offs between energy and nutrient recovery? And in general, what are the costs, both economic and unintended environmental consequences of implementing new systems? So this is really just a sampling of what is uh, possible and many other things. But we, uh, these are major ones, and we keep them in mind, and you're going to see them appear uh, for some of the questions that we're, we're trying to answer. Over the years, uh, we have worked on a variety of tools, uh, WEST, the Water Energy Sustainability Tool, and uh, the Wastewater Energy Sustainability Tool are also used in this research, as you're going to see a little later. Uh, we're going to focus on the methods uh, that go into these uh, tools and then show you some case studies to see uh, what are the capabilities and what we're going to uh, uh, what we're going to um, uh, be looking at as samples uh, from past work uh, in this project as well. Uh, the latest tool that we have been uh, working on uh, is WestNet. Um, we're going to say a few words about it in a couple of minutes, but it's in beta version, so it's not yet available. But the others are at the website shown here. So the urban water system uh, process flow diagram is shown here. Um, as I said a couple of slides before, uh, good analysis starts with understanding the system. And so here we see both the, the water treatment and the wastewater uh, treatment system here as they are interconnected. And this is uh, not uh, always the level of resolution that we desire in a project like this, but this is the level of resolution that we can most of the time work with. And so this is the target uh, level of detail um, in this project. Uh, again, keeping in mind that making a change in one system, for example, uh, the wastewater system will have an effect on uh, the drinking water system as well. And then there is treatment of sludge and possibly some other byproducts uh, uh, from the system that are just as an important, just as important, and have effect on on, on other things. For example. Um, uh, biodigestion of organic waste in the wastewater uh, system uh, creates a biogas which can be uh, burnt, combusted, uh, and made electricity with, which then has an effect on um, the electricity system supplying electricity to water and wastewater treatment. So it's very important to get this uh, system description right. The next step is, of course, uh, to look at uh, all of the data and this is the crux of life cycle assessment, uh, not just the level of resolution, but, but the level of the detail that we can obtain. And keeping this in mind, we have several versions of uh, the WEST tool. The most detailed one, and that is downloadable from uh, the shown website, uh, is an Excel uh, tool that essentially requires uh, the most data that one 
uh, things is needed for a for for a good analysis and requires data a lot of data collection and a, and a lot of data input. Uh, the other two uh, or the other version, the the web version, um, might uh, uh, suffice to have a limited amount of data and of course the results need to be uh, then kept in mind uh, to to have been to, uh, uh, generated with a more limited uh, set of data. Uh, the I mentioned briefly the West uh, uh, the West Web uh, as a sort of a central place uh, to go, uh, and um, uh, the user selects whether um, the user wants to assess a water system or the wastewater system, and it enters some uh, basic data, uh, for example, functional unit, uh, the unit of analysis, gallons of water or gallons of wastewater treated, um, and then. Uh, a variety of um, uh, data related to the collection, treatment, and discharge system, also keeping in mind the lifetime of these systems and, um, and operation and, and maintenance that will be done over this planning horizon. Uh, we have given the user uh, an ability to change things uh, in these tools and still uh, you know, maintain some control over the quality of the results, uh, but um, one needs to understand that this is an evolving uh, project. It has started some time ago and will continue into the future, uh, including all of the um, additions and lessons learned through the UN uh, project. And so uh, the, the user is encouraged to use it as we're going to show in a couple of slides uh, of how it can be done. And then it, uh, the user is encouraged to come back and uh, uh, use it again, uh, perhaps with more detailed data that the user has themselves uh, uh, collected. So that's sort of the principle uh, behind uh, providing these decision support uh, tools is that we uh, continuously work on making the modeling uh, more representative of reality I'm trying to get better default data to help users that do not uh, themselves collect the data, uh, but also allow very informed users, uh, for example, water and wastewater utility uh, managers uh, to assess their own environmental footprint or um, decision makers uh, in the state or in the city to do the same uh, as uh, you know, they have an opportunity to get, uh, get the data they and the resolution that they that they want. Uh, the the area that we operate in within UN it, uh, relates to urban water and wastewater systems, as opposed to agricultural uh, systems. And the uh, uh, objectives of our project are to uh, maintain uh, and provide access to decisions through these our better decisions through these uh, decision support tools I've mentioned, evaluating traditional and non-traditional water sources under current and future conditions using life cycle assessment with appropriate data, which often are regional and, and local. We also uh, strive to characterize existing conventional and centralized urban water infrastructure in the UN case study cities, and some have been identified already, uh, although uh, this list may change a little bit in the future, uh, cities like Denver, Portland, Baltimore, Miami, um, and potentially others, uh, with the goal of characterizing the urban water infrastructure in these cities to provide a baseline for the future in comparing uh, to this baseline alternative technologies that may make the systems more energy and environmentally efficient. Uh, we also have a goal of connecting uh, the UWIN research and researchers to another uh, effort uh, through um, uh, an NSF-funded engineering research center called RENEWIT, Reinventing the Nation's Urban Water Infrastructure, which is a, a joint project between Stanford University, um, University of California, Berkeley, Colorado School of Mines, and New Mexico State. Uh, in, in the sense that uh, both uh, research groups are doing, uh, in some ways, a similar research to, uh, to maximize um, 
uh, energy efficiency um, and uh, technology development and technology deployment and to maximize the synergies and expand the knowledge base and avoid re the redundancies between these uh, two large uh, research uh, efforts. But we're not going to be further talking about that today unless there are some questions about it. So the, the goals of the project uh, uh, have um, uh, uh, you know, prompted us to do a, a number of things already, uh, such as comparing energy and greenhouse gas implications, uh, or finding the data, rather, for comparing energy and greenhouse gas implications for alternative water sources and wastewater processes and some conventional, decentralized, septic, and other uh, systems. Um, in the past, we have also analyzed options for reducing water losses uh, in distribution systems and seeing how these investments compare uh, to other non-water benchmarks. Um, we have evaluated alternatives for land application of biosolids. We have looked at an innovative uh, uh, MBR technology for decentralized portable reuse compared to centralized groundwater augmentation. We have studied spatial and demographic implications for energy and greenhouse gas trade-offs between centralized and decentralized non-portable reuse. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. We have done some work uh, around Australia's millennium drought um, and, and have written a paper on it that's in review currently. Uh, and also have just completed work on electricity consumption uh, for California's water uh, system network uh, for 2020 and 2030 as compared to the 2010 uh, baseline. And we're utilizing a lot of what we have learned in these past projects in the current uh, you win a uh, task as well. So first we're going to show you a couple of examples, again, uh, uh, how we are building capability for analyzing uh, various case studies in these uh, uh, test uh, or, or uh, in these case study cities. A little later we'll, we'll show you some drinking water treatment examples and some wastewater treatment uh, examples. Uh, so a typical a way to assess how utilities are doing is, of course, uh, uh, comparing uh, or, or assessing them in their own right uh, based on uh, the source of water uh, that they are getting, uh, local surface water, imported water, which is, of course, very popular in places like California, uh, groundwater use, and, and then uh, uh, desalination of seawater or brackish uh, groundwater, and then water recycling. And so. This example that we have uh, published uh, previously, and you see a, uh, a link, or a, rather a mention of a uh, California Energy Commission final uh, project report uh, here in the lower right corner, which you can find online. Uh, we, uh, and this is, has also been published in, in a peer-reviewed paper, we have looked at Southern California and Northern California utilities. We're not naming them here, but you can see that uh, they, uh, the utilities are very different in terms of the annual volume of water produced in millions of gallons, but also in terms of the water mix that they, uh, that they uh, use uh, uh, to treat and then uh, dispense to the, to the customers. And so this water mix uh, and the economies of scale associated with these utilities then, of course, uh, determines their uh, energy and then correspondingly their greenhouse gas and other environmental performance. And as you can see, size is not always a, a very good determinant uh, as far as the energy use and the economies of scale sometimes uh, you know, make a big difference and other times not so much. But as you can see on the bottom uh, figure here, uh, there are great differences. Um, in fact, uh, orders of magnitude differences between the utilities and their energy use per, per gallon uh, treated. Uh, the difference, again, primarily comes from scale, but also the amount of pumping and the amount of treatment uh, that is done at the facilities. And so uh, the, the Northern California uh, utility uh, uh, that you know, NC2 currently is proposed to substitute some of its imported water with uh, desalination and as the lower figure shows, this is going to essentially double its energy use. And so decisions like this, is, uh, uh, these are very um, important 
to the utilities, but also other decision makers in the region and the state, um, as well as the energy system in general. And so um, they, we, we think they're very valuable and they ought to be explored before uh, investments are actually started. Uh, comparing one utility's alternative water sources uh, is another way to look at this, but also what's important uh, to, to note here is what contributes to these greenhouse gas uh, footprints. Uh, as I said, treatment and pumping and use of chemicals is, is, are, are typically the top uh, three things, but uh, there are scenarios where the infrastructure might be uh, uh, very important as well, the amount of pipes and fittings and uh, storage tanks and, and other things that are related water systems. In Southern California, of course, there are lots of uh, water uh, options and um, uh, as we can see in the lower uh, uh, figure, um, it makes a big difference uh, where the water comes from but also what uh, the, the system looks like. So in terms of imported water, here's an example where uh, the pipes and fittings contribute uh, 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 you know, significantly to the overall uh, greenhouse gas uh, uh, footprint, uh, and if the imported water is substituted with desalinated water, which is uh, for which the source is local, then some of this infrastructure can be reduced. Um, in the next couple of examples, we're going to show you uh, some capability that we have de uh, developed in analyzing wastewater treatment systems, just like for the water system. Uh, the first step is to uh, map uh, the processes going on in wastewater treatment. Uh, this shows a typical, uh, quote unquote, conventional centralized wastewater treatment uh, plant uh, with two options. Uh, one is uh, where uh, the energy um, is, uh, or the biogas uh, is captured and uh, uh, and um, uh, combusted for electricity generation and an option when uh, that uh, a biogas is not captured or rather captured and flared rather than made into uh, electricity. And this is a, an example again that, uh, that we had uh, published before in this uh, uh, paper in uh, 2010. Uh, a takeaway uh, from this is uh, about the contribution of the various pieces of the puzzle th that in this case that material production for the case study system which uh, happens to be a large again unnamed uh, wastewater system in uh, Northern California um, uh, meeting the needs about half a million customers the material production is the most significant contributor uh, to the uh, greenhouse gas footprint uh, and the energy production uh, bar is not so significant on the account of uh, this biogas being uh, burned and, gener and electricity generated uh, with it. The hypothetical system is the other alternative when, when um, uh, electricity is not generated at the plant and as you can see the energy input uh, into uh, the footprint is, is, uh, is, is in fact uh, more significant than the material, uh, materials needed for the system. Uh, uh, them, themselves. So, uh, you know, this is a techno technological alternative for wastewater uh, treatment, uh, which can be analyzed using uh, using W West. Uh, this example is about uh, changing the system altogether, uh, going uh, to a decentralized wastewater treatment system uh, relative to a centralized one. So the top one is the one that uh, we have developed some results for before. And then the bottom system that is centralized here just means that homes are off the grid and have a septic tank uh, and some neighborhood scale uh, treatment, a recirculating sand filter and UV uh, treatment. And um, we can develop the results uh, for them. And perhaps somewhat, uh, uh, somewhat surprisingly, um, the, uh, the, uh, the decentralized systems are um, not, not all that um, environmentally um, and from an energy perspective uh, uh, preferable uh, to a centralized system. But uh, scenarios can be imagined 
where the decentralized system doesn't quite have the scale uh, and is still um, environmentally more preferable than a centralized system. And in fact, we're going to show an example um, uh, perhaps about it uh, later. So at this point, I'm going to turn over to Jen to talk about some other uh, examples of uh, related to the wastewater treatment system. So we've shown you the very beginning of our kind of dive into comparing the effects of scale of systems on the life cycle impacts associated particularly with wastewater treatment, but also with water reuse. Um, the first, in the first example that ARPOD just presented, the water from that system is not reused, and so therefore none of the benefits associated with supplying some of the water were credited to that account. But now we're going to look at some examples where um, there are both wastewater benefits and water supply benefits. And we had, we've done a couple of studies on decentralized reuse within the city of San Francisco. Um, and the first one I'm going to confess I didn't actually work on, but um, I'm somewhat familiar with. And it is looking at um, a living machine installation that is located at the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission headquarters in San Francisco. And it um, consists of a combination of tidal and vertical flow wetlands that treat wastewater to be reused for toilet flushing within their headquarters building. Um, it's sized to treat about 1.2 million gallons per year. Um, and the treatment process is intended to remove all the organic matter and nutrients before sending the, the treated water into the building. Um, and they're very proud. They showcase this system and we'll give tours of it. Um, it was really uh, very innovative when it was installed several years ago. Um, but it's not a perfect um, example of a decentralized system, and, and they intend to learn a lot from it. Here are some pictures of what the actual wetland um, infrastructure looks like from the ground surface. The facility is located primarily in their basement, but it, it opens up into the sidewalk area around the building, so you can see kind of the, the surface layer of the wetlands in, um, if you walk along the street outside their building. But when we did the analysis of the system, one thing we figured out is that there is a lot of room for improvement within decentralized wastewater treatment. Um, you can see here a comparison of the energy consumption and the greenhouse gas emissions associated with the living machine on the left and the wastewater treatment plant on the right. That would be the alternative of treating the water at San Francisco's centralized wastewater treatment plant and then pumping water to be reused for toilet flushing within their building. And the centralized option is significantly preferable by these two metrics. Um, the reason for this is largely because the greenhouse gases in the centralized wastewater treatment plant are captured and used for biogas production, but in the living machine they're not captured, they're just emitted, the methane is emitted from the settling tank, I believe. And that difference makes um, contributes significantly to the greenhouse gas implications of that system. Um, and on the, the pump, the energy side, the issue is more that the pumps that were used in the living machine system were not optimized particularly for their application, and, and they're, they're just not running very efficiently. So the energy required to pump the water down into the basement and back up into the wetlands and then within the building is probably more than it needs to be. So there's significant room for improvement. And one way that they analyzed in this paper a potential improvement is how would these systems compare if we did manage to capture the greenhouse gases um, instead of emitting them. And in that case, you can see from the gray outlined boxes that, in fact, um, if they were able, able to capture it, then um, comparing that to the alternative of using their centralized wastewater treatment plant and then sending the recycled water back to the building is in fact fairly comparable on an energy um, standpoint and even a little lower from a greenhouse gas standpoint. So, so even though this system does not function particularly well, we can see that the technology could improve so that it, it, it could compete with a centralized um, system with some improvement. Um, so after this kind of initial installation of San Francisco, the PUC's decentralized water wastewater treatment system and re water reuse system, um, 
the city moved towards a non-potable water ordinance where um, in certain areas of the city, any building constructed over 250,000 square feet is required to have an alternative source of water for toilet flushing and irrigation. So for, for large non-potable water uses within the building, um, and then there, it can be either building or district scale. District scale meaning that multiple buildings would share a facility and would um, pump the water between them. And they have some financial support for these systems. So all of a sudden, the city of San Francisco has become an innovation leader for decentralized wastewater treatment. So we wanted to know where does it make sense to put decentralized treatment when you want to compare it to a non-potable water um, alternative. And so we compared decentralized treatment using a, an MBR um, with the centralized treatment plant that exists, although it, it would be upgraded to provide tertiary treatment so that the water could be reused. Um, and in fact, a similar assumption was made in, this, in the living machine study as well, although we did not show that part of this diagram. So um, the fact that one thing we know about um, wastewater treatment tends is almost always true is that there are economies of scale associated with treatment. We would always expect centralized treatment to have lower energy and emissions associated with it than decentralized treatment because of the economies of scale. On the other hand, we also know that there are diseconomies of scale associated with distribution. So having large distribution networks um, to redistribute your re recycled water um, has an, an energy and a greenhouse gas penalty associated. So what we wanted to figure out is, based on the specific demographics of San Francisco, where we have both high population density areas and low population density areas, um, and then we also have areas where water, water demand is high or low, depending on the type of development in that area, and, and we know we have significant elevation differences across the city, as well as um, you know, pretty significant distances from the two wastewater treatment plants that are shown with the green stars in the city. We wanted, so the combination of all of these effects, we wanted to know where does it make sense to install decentralized reuse in the city. And we came up with these graphs where the green areas um, make a lot of sense to put decentralized systems in and the yellow and orange graphs do not. Um, one note about these results is that they're not completely representative of San Francisco's de decision-making space because, um, in fact, in order to reuse their water, they would need to do um, RO treatment on it because of seawater intrusion issues into their wastewater collection system. Um, and we didn't account for that. So, in fact, their centralized treatment energy would be higher than we had accounted for. But actually, the results for the situation where we looked at the RO effects are available on the web, but I didn't include the address here. You can contact me if you want to see how that changes the analysis. Um, but we looked at what contributes to the differences in the results, and it tended to be um, for decentralized systems, treatment was a really big deal. That is what we expected to see. And for the centralized, a lot more of the effects were due to pumping and embodied energy within the piping also basically what we expected to see. But now we know exactly how they contribute. Um, and we um, know that if we were to be able to improve MBR operation and make it more efficient, which we think is very possible, um, that we can see where, where um, decentralized systems would become more um, competitive with centralized reuse, assuming we could make some probably fairly straightforward efficiency improvements within the system. So another um, part of the water system that we've looked at, I'm actually going to cut this pretty short because I want to get to what we've done for UN so far, is to look at uh, very specific improvements within distribution systems. And we compared um, for two case study cities, I think this, these results are probably from Philadelphia, um, although I didn't make a note of that. We looked at trade-offs between installing additional infrastructure, basically valve control, valve controls um, on pressure reducing valves so that the pressure within the um, distribution system is either controlled in a fixed way, so the outlet 
um, pressure is fixed or in a dy dynamic and flow modulated way where the, the pressure within the system responds actively to demand. Um, and we wanted to see what the trade-offs were for the cost and the operation and maintenance associated with having that additional control infrastructure versus what um, we can save in terms of avoided electricity use and chemical consumption and water consumption from avoiding water losses because of excessive pressure within the system. And what we found is that there's actually significant improvement associated with installing flow modulated pressure control valves because the water loss is avoided. If, if you locate them efficiently, the water losses avoided are significant um, and the, the infrastructure associated with installing them relative to the electricity and chemical infection is very small. And then we, we took those results and some other work that um, Tommy Hendrickson did on the optimal way to replace pipes within a water distribution system and compared what the greenhouse gas abatement potential um, in, in cost terms is for water interventions compared to other more common interventions like lighting or insulation or changing to more renewable energy. And that those results are shown here for um, one utility within California. It's a medium-sized utility in Southern California so that um, electricity required to provide water supply in this utility is fairly high. But for this particular utility, um, saving water is actually more effective than a lot of the more common um, interventions in terms of a cost-effective manner. Um, and you can see here technologies that have economic savings are on the left side of the orange line. And those with co costs, net costs are on the right. So on top of having these economic savings, you're also saving water, which for these particular utilities is very important. We um, looked at two other utilities, one in Northern California with a much lower um, actually both in Northern California, but they tended to have lower energy requirements for their water. But and even in those cases, most of the interventions, water-related interventions, tended to be negative cost or close to zero cost um, relative to other things. So um, most of this work we did pr prior to UN. Um, it was funded primarily by the California Energy Commission and the Renew It Engineering Research Center. And it, for both of those funding sources, we focused on arid west areas in California primarily, but also somewhat in other western states. And in those areas, the key drivers for a lot of these interventions are getting more water, or either through conservation or through supply. Um, and within California, there's somewhat of a driver to limit greenhouse gases, where it is still regulated here. Um, so when we look forward to how this is going to um, be implemented within UN, we're expecting to use some of the similar methodologies and build on work we've done in the past. But because the case study cities in UN are much more diverse and have a broader set of alternatives available to them for innovation within their kind of broad urban water network and are motivated by a more diverse set of drivers and have different resources available, we expect that we will learn some um, much more interesting and um, learn more from that set of utilities that they and figure out ways they can learn from each other than we have been able to do with the more um, uniform utilities that we've, we've evaluated up to now. But um, because we really haven't had a lot of student support up to now, uh, mostly just in the summers, uh, we don't actually have results associated with our UN work um, at this point, it's still very preliminary, but we have made progress. Um, for each of the six original case study regions, we were able to go through and find um, publicly available information that is relevant to our work and identify data gaps um, that we need to fill in order to be able to analyze them more completely. And then we prioritize those to limit the scope of our data requests because um, when it comes to when it comes to the data needed to, to really do a complete life cycle assessment, the data we would love to have, it is very significant. You can see on the left this graph that shows what we would, in an ideal world, the amount of data we would like to have to do a really complete analysis, and that's just for the water supply component. If we wanted to look at wastewater services, it would add um, portion of the graph on the or the chart on the right. 
Um, if we wanted to look at, at recycled and other alternative water supply, it would add this next section, and then there's some information that we would be interested in related to energy suppliers. And in this graph, this is based on our original data collection last summer, and the green is what we have, um, the yellow is what we have some of, and the red is what we don't know anything about for the original case study cities. So data um, is a big issue for us. But based on our prior work, we're able to prioritize a fair bit, and we know what, what is likely to really affect the results more significantly. So we've narrowed that down to these starred components, which basically boil down to how much water is being processed through each of these different systems for water supply or wastewater treatment, or in some cases, we might want to look at stormwater management, although that's not covered here. Um, and then how much energy is consumed, and then how, man, how many chemicals are consumed in the process of providing these services. And we're hoping that we'll be able to get um, that data from utilities so that we can go forward with our analysis. And that means that in this data collection sheet, which we've created long ago to um, do these analyses, we would really only be asking for the boxes that are shown in green, Whereas if a utility was really generous and wanted to give us everything we wanted for a water treatment plant, in this particular example, we would, we would try to get all of the, the additional data shown in blue. Um, but we're, we're um, trying to, to narrow that down in order to um, encourage utilities to participate in the work so that we can um, go forward. So um, we've met with representatives from two utilities, Miami and Denver, to, to discuss data collection. But at this point, we've only gotten enough data to start the analysis for Denver's wastewater system. And we are in the process of starting that analysis now. Um, we've definitely been delayed by slow data collection. Um, and that has limited our ability to actually conduct these analyses for the case study cities. But we're now trying to look. Um, and see whether because of past work and, and related work, we, we could start analyses for San Francisco and Los Angeles, and particularly some other cities, um, based on what we already have, um, and just narrow our expectations and, and really frame our questions for the, the data that we have available. As a side note, last summer we worked with a UN student and some other UN colleagues, Sybil Charvel at um, Colorado State and Forrest Meggers at Princeton, to look at um, trade-offs for um, how heat recovery can be implemented within wastewater systems and the trade-offs associated with scale um, of those systems. Um, and we're hoping to maybe be able to look more into that in the future, because um, that was just sort of a, a first a foundation for that analysis. Um, in coming years, and this is our last slide, um, we are hoping to complete the data collection and opportunity characterization, so the baseline analyses for our case study cities in fairly short order, at least at a cursory level, so we can start figuring out what, um, what the big issues are going to be um, between these, the cities that we are considering within UN. Um, and then once we have those baseline metrics available, then we would want to look at what, what happens if we implement more innovative solutions within those systems, and how, does, how are those affected um, both by spatial characteristics and um, how do they change over time. And that can be um, driven by many different things for the different cities. In some cases within UN, there are cities that are going to be driven by water supply and are going to innovate in that direction. LA and Phoenix in particular are likely driven by that. Um, but there are other um, systems where the, the drivers are going to be more wastewater um, driven or looking at protecting water supply, avoiding seawater intrusion, or adapting to climate change and, and um, making innovative innovating to um, avoid the impacts of sea level rise or other effects. Um, and so we would really want to take into account the unique challenges and needs of each of these cities um, and what their future may look like and how that could be different between them. And then we, at the same time, we want to continue to identify collaboration opportunities, both in ways to apply LCA to urban water systems, but also um, more generally to explore trade-offs within these systems associated with the energy water nexus. And that is um, all we have prepared. <laughs>
we're happy to take questions at this time. Excellent. Thank you, guys. So as a reminder, you can enter questions into the chat or question queue. Um, I don't see anything yet, but maybe we'll just give it a good 30 seconds or so, uh, see if anything pops up. We are excited to hear more details about this uh, in a couple of weeks at the annual meeting. Looking yeah. forward to seeing you and everyone else. I'll try not to lose my mind between now and then. <laughs> Okay, well, so still, oh, Sybil says that she's working on a question. Um, so as a reminder, guys, I'll, I'll send out the link to this video once it has been posted on our YouTube channel. Uh, all of the webinars are uploaded uh, usually within a week or so after uh, the presentation. So if there's anything you missed so far, you can always go to our YouTube channel. It's under the One Water Solutions Institute. Um, you can enter that or uh, you could search for UN as well. Uh, so feel free to, to check there for anything you may have missed. Um, one question that just came up is, how will you incorporate spatial data? I think that um, that is going to depend on what we have um, available. Um, there, there's a fair bit of that available um, publicly for certain areas, and we haven't actually gone in to try to collect that. Um, but we think that we can get data for at least some, if not all, of the cities um, based on what we've done with other case studies in the past. Uh, but yeah, we haven't looked to be sure. Maybe it would be useful to go through the exercise of what it would what it will look like to assess a city's water and wastewater system. So um, let's take Denver, where we have some uh, good data available for wastewater treatment, though not for water treatment uh, already in hand. And so, you know, our task would be to look at the conventional, you know, as existing uh, currently water and wastewater system, uh, put uh, a number on the energy and other, you know, greenhouse gas and other environmental impacts of water and wastewater, and then identify alternatives to the current system. For example, decentralizing it, uh, for example, using alternative sources of water uh, and uh, seeing how uh, those interventions in the future might lower or change uh, positively or negatively the energy and other environmental uh, you know, balance uh, of, of the system. So that, that's in short uh, the, uh, uh, the, the number of steps and the types of outcomes we would do in uh, analyzing a particular uh, utility or a, an entire city, uh, city's uh, water and wastewater system. So this is very, as, as Jen showed in uh, screenshots of those uh, uh, data sheets, uh, these things are very data intensive. Uh, at the minimum, we need a couple of uh, uh, data points. Uh, both about the water and wastewater systems as well as the energy systems in these cities. We have been able to obtain very good information about the energy, uh, the electricity mixes for these cities, uh, but um, you know, there's no magic in, in getting the data uh, other than having um, uh, an interaction with those water and wastewater utilities. So that's sort of how we see the inclusion of the geographical data, if that's our, if our definition of the geographical data agrees with the, the uh, uh, person's uh, definition who asked the question. Yeah, I, I think, and just to, to add to that point a little bit, I think that what our hope is, is that we're if we're able to do kind of a cursory um, and first pass analysis with a small amount of data, um, maybe even data using assumptions about um, energy intensity based on the literature rather than about um, a utility's particular case that we can show that to the utilities and say if we had if you could give us better data then we could do so much more with this and, and that that would um, encourage some of the, the 
that spatial data or other data that we're not able to get, it might encourage them to um, invest more in the project. So that's our that's our goal, or one of our goals. Okay, S Sybil has a question, but I'm going to try to magically unmute her and let her ask it directly. So, Sybil, you, sh you should be unmuted now. Okay, can you hear me? We can. Yes. Awesome. Okay, so I was wondering about with the SFPU system, it sounded like a big driver for the life cycle um, calculations with respect to greenhouse gases and things with re for that system were a result of the... Um, the capture of the solids that they do on site and that those, um, the methane for those gets released prior to it going to the wastewater facility. So you lose some of that um, energy generation potential from the water that they're capturing. So I'm wondering if they found a way to more directly um, transfer those solids to the wastewater facility without storing them there on site, if that could, uh, would that be a substantial benefit to the life cycle considerations or is how much of a driver is that? Yeah, um, we've talked to them about that, like ways that they could could reduce those emissions. And to my knowledge, nothing has changed on how that's being operated, but I actually have not asked that specific question, so I could be wrong. Um, the the like I said, I didn't. I wasn't um, actively involved in this analysis when it went on. A, a postdoc who has since left did most of that work, but um, so I don't know how quickly those emissions happen and so how how much potential there would be to avoid that because there is a certain amount of settling that has to happen in order to, to just separate the solids from the, the liquid component um, and I don't so I don't know quite how quickly all of that is happening um, and when the emissions so, but but I don't think anything's changed. Um, right. Sounds like it sounds like it is a fairly large driver that if they could do something about it, it, it could have right. a substantial impact. Yes. Yeah. I mean, yes, that's true. But but on, on the other hand, this is one system for one building. So when you look at the city's greenhouse gas emissions, it's not. Um, Significant, so so it's not necessarily their top priority for fixing, because um, they could they could do more in other ways. Um, but, but you know, it's a good question because once this starts happening at scale, right, right, with every you know every basement of every high rise having this settling tank and releasing yes. greenhouse gases, yes, that becomes uncaptured. Yeah. Then yeah, that, that's then that's okay. And 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 again, you know, point well taken is that sort of figuring out a way to doing it now while it's still at a manageable small scale is probably, you know, more than educational for them. Mm -hmm. Right. I would agree. And I think, I think there's technologies that you could, I mean, they were more costly from a capital perspective, but there's certainly technologies that you separate those solids and get them um, transferred into a wastewater collection system pretty quickly. Right. Right. Um, and I know that there have been discussions um, with the city about how to, to reduce those emissions. I haven't been in on all of those. So um, I think that, that they that this one of the benefits of this study was to make them aware of that um, and to start trying to think about, you know, how can we make this look better as we um, are implementing um, the non-potable reuse requirement for many buildings rather than just our one. Um, right. Thanks. Uh, that's also a political process because the, the PUC, you know, it, it's a political process. So um, there's that too. <laughs> it's not a purely engineering driven decision space. All right. Thank you. Great conversation, guys. Well, I'm, I haven't seen any more questions come in, so uh, I think you have amazed and stunned everybody. <laughs> everybody um, still wants to be on vacation. Right, right. Yeah, no, we, we uh, you know, good turnout today, given the, the holiday weekend just yeah. wrapping up. So, 
Great. Well, I'll be sure to send out the link to this, and you guys can forward that along to any of your colleagues that may have missed today's presentation. And we look forward to seeing everybody at the end of the month. And just a reminder, we won't uh, be resuming our webinars until August 10th. Uh, so we'll stay tuned for our next presentation on green infrastructure. Thanks for tuning in, guys, and have a wonderful afternoon.